continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to welcome back Robert Pine for the second part of his two-part presentation on Polish genealogy. Robert is the president of the Polish Genealogical Society of America. He also is the director of an organization that for 49 years organizes school visits and summer immersion English programs in Eastern Europe, especially Poland. Uh, Robert has been researching his Polish and Polish-Lithuanian ancestry for many years, leading to almost all lines reaching the early 1700s and in a couple of cases even earlier. He has visited Poland 18 times and Lithuania six times. In the course of his research in visiting ancestral villages, he has located relatives in both countries. Through visiting the countries many times, except for one case, Lithuania, all of his research and discoveries have been accomplished from home on his computer. The exception is the, uh, is the uncovering of his Vilnius, I hope I pronounced it right, Vilnius, uh, Lithuania of the NKBB slash KGB file on his great, excuse me, on his grand uncle, who in the early 1950s was sent to the mines of the Soviet Gulag under Stalin, where he died. Today, Robert will introduce you to the resources and services of the Polish Genealogical Society of America and provide the general public and its members with history, uh, ancestral research. So with that, I'd like to welcome Robert. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And it's a pleasure to be back since last month when we did the general introduction. And today we'll expand on that and start looking at how to research your roots in Poland. Of course, research in the United States is pretty straightforward, no matter your ethnic background. But once you jump overseas, whether it's, uh, as you were speaking earlier, Ireland, Scotland, France, whatever it might be, uh, things change a little bit. Uh, two things to start. First of all, let me just say that this could be easily a two-day seminar. So we're going to run through a lot of things, give you a flavor of where to go, what to do, ideas, and so forth. But uh, to get into depth, it could easily take uh, a day or two days of, uh, of a nice seminar. Secondly, I don't know the depth of everyone who is uh, attending. Some might be beginners, some might be well-seasoned, many of you are, are in between. So uh, we'll probably be covering a few things that uh, are uh, geared more towards the, uh, the beginner. And uh, so if you're an ex experienced person, just uh, bear through that. And if we get a little advanced, uh, the others can bear through that a little bit, because I'm, I'm sure we have somewhat diverse uh, audience. So let's start off, first of all, but what do we mean by Poland? Um, borders change everywhere in the world, some much more than others. Uh, sometimes countries like Poland actually disappear for a while. So one does have to make sense out of what do we mean by Poland? So old Poland, going back you know, to the 10th, 11th century, but uh, uh, particularly uh, looking at the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which goes from the middle of the 16th century up until the partitions in the late 1700s. There were three partitions that uh, took Poland apart bit by bit as Germany, the Prussian Empire, Germany, Austria-Hungarian Empire, and the Russian Empire in three stages split up uh, what had been the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Today, that includes areas not only within Poland's uh, current borders, but pretty much all of Lithuania, Belarus, and a very large chunk of Western Ukraine, and a touching here and there of some Russian, Latvian, and Estonian lands. So uh, that's why you may find that, uh, looking here at the map, if you find Polish ancestors who immigrate here, they uh, won't necessarily say they're Poland, it's, you know, if they're coming over in the 19th, early 20th century, because of the fact that they were coming from one of the other uh, uh, occupying powers. So they would have on their uh, information, uh, their passport, uh, their, their statement with customs and so forth, Austria, Austria-Hungary, Russia, Prussia, Germany. Uh, you're not going to find Poland too often, um, though sometimes you will because it'll be a good Polish nationalist who believes it, you know, Poland still should exist and they put down Poland. But you can see Poland at that time for a couple of centuries was about the largest landmass in uh, Europe, 
until Russia expanded, uh, but it was still easily larger than, than France and so a few Italy and uh, United Kingdom and so forth. Uh, highly diverse, multiple languages, multiple religions, uh, very, very uh, cosmopolitan country at that time. So it has an interesting uh, history uh, from from those points of view, much different than most other countries that uh, were were quite quite the same in terms of religion and ethnicity and so forth. Um, so we mentioned that Poland ceased to exist. I mentioned you know that they, they're going to be citizens of of the various three empires through those uh, through that period of time. And then uh, after the Second World War, uh, I should say the First World War, the pink area here is Poland uh, reconstructed uh, after the First World War. And you can see it still has many of the outlying areas, uh, the Cressy, as they call it, the Eastern portion here, the borderlands. Um, but then after the Second World War, uh, Stalin changed the borders. He pushed Poland over here westward, taking over areas that were part of uh, Germany. And these areas were then absorbed primarily by the Ukraine and Belarus and a little bit of Lithuania. So there's been a lot going on in terms of what are the borders, what makes you Polish. So you could be Polish, but from the Ukraine, Polish from Belarus, Polish from Lithuania, like my uh, one of my family are, are Poles with a good Pol Eastern Polish name of uh, Punkiewicz, but they came from about this area in Lithuania. A lot of Poles did move to Lithuania for, for land and so forth. Uh, you may have German roots if you were originally from this area or the north, Austrian roots down here. Um, and of course, uh, some people may have um, Muslim roots, Tartar roots, um, all these different nationalities in Poland. So DNA can very, be very surprising and helpful at some times. And of course, you know, very, very large population of, of Jews in Poland uh, for several hundred years. But where do we start? First, you need good foundational data. Before you leap over the pond and start looking in Poland, you really have to grab hold of everything you can here to have that foundation on which to build. But you want to identify, organize, correlate everything, particularly who was born here, who immigrated, when did they immigrate? Uh, do you know where they originated? What part of Poland? How fine-tuned can that be? Is it it's difficult when we get questions about my grandmother came from Western Poland. Yeah, okay. <laughs> or even they came from Poznań. Well, was it the province or the city? Um, if it's not the city, uh, Poznań, you know, there's, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred villages and towns in Poznań province and so forth. Where did they settle here? Uh, they may have not come to say Chicago immediately. They may have stayed in New York. They may have gone someplace else. They may have worked in the mines in, uh, say, the coal mines of Pennsylvania and then decided to move west and get a farm in Nebraska. Uh, you know, but, but when they were there, other information exists that can be very helpful in identifying uh, from where they came, when they came, who they came with, uh, and so forth. Sometimes entire villages or large parts of villages would either en masse or over a short period of time, move from a village or a couple of villages in Poland and end up in the same place. One or two would come, they'd say this is a great spot. Uh, and uh, it's another way of finding out where they came from. You may not know it from your case, but if, if you have a general idea and you have all these other people or a good proportion of these people coming from that same region or same couple of villages, you can make the assumption that that's a good place to start your research overseas. Even in a big city, I found a lot of names in Chicago in the same neighborhood within a stone's throw of each other or a couple of blocks of each other in the same neighborhood of Chicago. So you didn't have people from the same towns, one moving to the north side, one moving to the south side, one moving to Indiana uh, next to the Illinois border. No, they tended to all migrate uh, close to each other. Standard, you know, procedure here in genealogical research: find the documents, get the oral histories, um, look at the, find out uh, where where people had parishes here with cemeteries. Go visit them. Look at the documents in the cemetery offices. Look at the tombstones. You might find that there are different spellings of the last names. 
um, especially on the older ones, they would have, you know, more likely the, the original uh, surname spelling, uh, which then became more and more Angloized, uh, even though it looks Polish. Um, find out, uh, particularly with the parishes and local organizations, what to what things did they belong? What Polish organizations did the men and women belong to? What records might they have? Uh, insurance policies. Uh, one of the things we have at the PGSA is access to a large, large number of the uh, insurance death claims of the Polish uh, uh, insurance company and uh, the PRCOA, the Polish um, Roman Catholic uh, Union of America. The applications for the insurance have very interesting information. Not only helpful for pure genealogical research, but you get a picture of the person. They oftentimes with the medical, like any other insurance policy, will have height, hair color, weight, things of this nature. Sometimes for women, you know, how many children they had, but also maybe if they had a miscarriages and so forth. So there's a lot of personal information that can also often be found in these types of documents. Names, okay, spellings. Here's a couple of interesting examples from uh, my own family research. Uh, when young, I knew that, you know, going back to great, great grandparents, there was someone in, called Druze. Well, it doesn't sound like a Polish name. It isn't. Um, here are the three varieties I found, sometimes with one S, sometimes with two, and a slightly different uh, collection of vowels, U, J, O, which is an OO sound in Polish, and a J, and an OY, depending upon whether the writer at the church um, for the parish records happened to be writing in um, Polish, Latin, or German. But at least you know, all of these sound pretty much are exactly the same, but it did change slightly with the history through the family. Uh, my father's line, Pienczykowski, we never knew that. We always had the last one, Pienczykowski. Somehow between Pienczykowski and Pienczykowski, the E got dropped. But also in Polish uh, records here, written by Polish priests, you can see also some other spellings because uh, the phonetics are about the same. So in one case, uh, we have instead of a CZY, we have a TRZY. Sounds pretty much the same. Ch. And then uh, the N sound, you have the uh, PIE with the tail. So Pien, Ch. And a Ch sound can also be a CI as well as a CZ, a Y. So, you know, you got to try and find out, um, go back, what other spellings might have been used by the family and how it, it, it might have changed until legally they did change it from Pinchakowski to Pine. Um, first names as well. Some are easy. Peter, Piot, Dorothy, Dorota, very close. But, you know, you might know uh, an ancestor uh, from American records or from family lore named Lawrence. Who would ever think it's <laughs> Vavzhinyets in Polish? And of course, Adalbert is Wojciech. So, um, you know, try and research these types of things. Uh, and if they do have records and it's a, uh, you know, an English sounding, uh, American sounding, not a Polish sounding first name, uh, go to a resource or, or Google and see what it is in Polish, because uh, as you go back in records, you're going to need to be looking for uh, Virginiets. There isn't going to be any Lawrence. There could be um, a Laurentius or something like that if written in Latin. So you, the Latin uh, forms will be uh, much closer. Adalbert would probably be Adalbert, uh, Albertus, Albertus. So, uh, but you're going to run into uh, the Polish uh, original words as well. And here's a few more good ones you might find. Um, the slash indicates uh, male and female. So uh, Bugoslav and Bugoslava. Kunigunda is a good one. Leocadia and so forth. Um, and then, of course, you've got the almost unpronounceable Zyszwav and Zyszwava. Um, But these are good, solid Polish names. But again, coming to America, I don't think too many are going to be keeping too many of these types of names very long. They would change them, you know, uh, to uh, some kind of similar or completely different, maybe uh, first name uh, to uh, 
to blend in better, to have people be able to pronounce their names and so forth. Of course, dates for everything is, is really important. Uh, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this, but um, you know, if they were naturalized, see if you can find the naturalization papers. Uh, that will give you some good information. Uh, military enlistment or draft. Um, I found out some information for some of my family from the First World War due to that. I was able to, I knew we, they came from Lithuania, but exactly where it actually, you know, some of these things had the town uh, indicated as to where he uh, originated. Divorce papers can be uh, very important as well, giving a good detailed information. Places, um, the, the key thing when going to Europe uh, and using uh, either the family search uh, records of the Mormons or going to the archives over there, either in person or uh, through the uh, websites that are available, is you need to know the parish. The village helps find the parish. So those are the two key ones. Um, not every village, of course, was a parish. Um, parishes would have three, five, ten you know, villages, depending upon uh, the population of those villages, uh, how proximate they were to the parish church. Um, but, you know, it wasn't one on one. So you're going to have to find the parish. That's where the records were kept uh, and preserved. And of course, in the U.S., uh, you you look at census records and directories and, and things of that nature to find you know what you can here. One key one I do like to make mention of, though, are local parishes here in the United States. Importantly, the marriage records for Polish baptismal parish information. Uh, some of the parishes, some of the time, depending on the priest, would, in the marriage record, to prove that they were Catholic, they were baptized, would also record the village parish where they were baptized in Poland. And if you're lucky enough to have one of those priests in one of those parishes, I mean, this is really great. I mean, it really helps you zero in. And here's an example, uh, St. John uh, Kantius, uh, Old Polish Church in Chicago. It's my great, great grandparents, Josef Kanczakowski. And you'll see here, this is the one that's a TRZY. But I know this is him and his marriage because he's being married to Apollonia Wojnska. Uh, and that's an L with a slash through it. That's why I said w Wojnska. Um, but you'll see here that he was born in Bukovo in the Powiat of Szczecin. And then uh, the, the, that's in the Russian partition and so forth. But I have now the information I need to then go back, look at the map, find it, and then go to uh, family search, see you know, what records they have uh, for that, uh, that town, that parish. And um, so if you're lucky to have something like this, that's really great. Um, here are some of the free sites. Uh, family search, I mentioned. Most of you are probably, I'm, I'm quite sure, uh, aware of that. Or, uh, Ginny uh, provides some information. Uh, of course, uh, well, I have to change this. Castle Gardens now, this site is no longer exists. It's all been absorbed into Ellis Island. So I have to change this. this. I'm sorry about that. And then there are Polish genealogical societies such as ours, the PGSA.org. We have a lot of good information out there available to the general public and uh, a lot more uh, under the membership. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with a couple of the big names in subscriptions, Ancestry and MyHeritage can help you get started. And for some reason, there we go. Newspaper obituaries can be very helpful. Um, yes, it gives you the date of death, but also, you know, the, the funeral date, the age, when and where they were buried, um, the funeral home that was utilized. And some funeral homes, you know, keep records, even if they're 100 years old, there might be something of interest there. It lists fa other family members, which is important. You know, there might be some people at that point in time who are listed, but maybe later on they are not listed. Maybe they moved, maybe they had a falling out with the family and were never talked about again. Um, maybe it could be that you know, some of them returned to Poland uh, to, 
of, of all immigrants, uh, 20 to 25 percent returned back home from the United States. They didn't stay here. Um, it, it can mention the organizations, the Polish organizations and other organizations uh, to which they were a member. But again, that can help you uh, see what other facts that might be available from those types of things. And from time to time, they'll reference family in Poland. So you might get some names and it'll say generally, you know, family in Poland, but it might list, you know, um, father's name, mother's name, uh, brothers and sisters, you know, it depends on what they wanted, how much they wanted to put into the obit. But sometimes you'll start getting some references to family in Poland. Uh, also, uh, if you have a, a good number of these from closely related uh, family members, you might see family members drop out. That could also be an indication that someone died uh, between funeral A and funeral B. If they tended to be on uh, several of the obituaries up until a certain point and then they're not seen again, that's another thing that could say, oh, somewhere after this time, I might want to start looking to see if this person uh, was deceased. Uh, here's an example from the Jenek Chikagoski of a couple different kinds of uh, obits. And in both cases, uh, well, here you can, you've got, uh, here's Yosef and Apollonia again. You can see that the uh, E has disappeared. Uh, and then that, that's the parents. And then his bro the brothers, sisters, um, brothers-in-laws, sisters-in-laws, and so forth. Uh, Gogolinsky was the funeral home. And um, and then, you know, the date and the time and everything. This was in 1926. Uh, the death was at uh, 1145 in the evening uh, and um, and so forth. So uh, and much of the same kind of information in uh, this format as well. So there's some some really good things here that, you know, you can pull out and, and utilize. And check spellings. Uh, we do, um, PGSA does publish books, and one of them is the study of obituaries. Um, it's over, oh, a little spelling error, I see. Uh, 80 pages, got over 50 examples, translation guides, all kinds of word lists and so forth. You don't have to, you know, know Polish to read an obit, particularly with a good guide and looking at the different formats. They're very formulaic. Um, but that's a good way of, of uh, you know, getting other information, particularly from those who are uh, the immigrants or first generation of immigrants, uh, because many of the other uh, originals and uh, family members, you know, will be noted. Uh, Obits can also be found at the Library of Congress, Ancestry and so forth, newspapers, um, like newspapers, uh, archive, ProQuest, et cetera. Of course, the Library of Congress is free. Most of the others are uh, by subscription or pay-per-view or something on that order. Usually, they'll give you at least a hint that something is out there if you do a, a name search. And a few other items. Um, the parishes can have lists of first communions and confirmations. Typically, they're names only. Um, sometimes they're not performed annually. Uh, particularly confirmations might be biannually or every three years, depending upon the, the size of the school, uh, the size of the classes and so forth. Um, but it can be used to identify that the family continued to reside in the parish. So if you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, they moved at some point in time, here's another way of trying to identify were they still going to this parish. Now they could have moved buildings, but still in the parish. Um, part of my family in the same parish for a decade and a half, but in that decade and a half, uh, or almost two decades, uh, they moved like four times. No more than a block, a block and a half away. Um, strange, but you know, some people, you know, a lot of people did that at the time. If they could save rent, or maybe they had another child and needed more space, but you can I, at least I can identify they're still in the same parish. Fully booked from the. Uh, from the parishes could also be good, particularly if uh, your relative, uh, your ancestor was a, a leader in the parish, made donations, uh, was a business supporter, maybe took out an ad. Um, sometimes there's lists of par uh, parishioners. Um, sometimes there are lists of uh, the organizations. Oftentimes parishioners and organizations and supporters will have photographs 
and you might find a photograph, which you may not have uh, from that period of time of a relative, if they happen to be, say, one of the organizations and, you know, there are 10, 15 members and there's a photograph of them uh, in the Jubilee book. So with kind of base underneath everything, what do we do when going to Poland? Okay. Mentioned earlier, the parish is the key. Uh, one of the places to start, uh, you can find it on our website. And I might add, just about everything I'm talking about here can be found on our website. Um, the Slovak, Slovnik, Geograficzna, et cetera, et cetera. It's a geographical dictionary. It's done in the late 19th century. It's huge. Uh, it's an enormous collection of volumes. I don't know if it's 15, 16, 17 volumes. Each one is almost a thousand pages. But they went through and recorded something about almost every city, town, village, and settlement in Poland. Major locations can have several to quite a number of pages. Most of them uh, will have a few column inches, a column inch. Some may only have a couple of lines, but it's the source to try and get an idea of, of the towns and the villages in Poland that you're researching. It will include, uh, whenever there was, was good information, events that may have happened in that town, when the church was built, uh, when the, the, the king went through or something like that, um, other events. Uh, importantly, uh, it'll usually tell you what parish it belonged to at that time. So if you know the town, but you don't know the parish, this is really a go-to for the 19th century and early 20th century to say, here is my village. Oh, and here's the parish. Now you can zero in and start looking for records where the records were kept. Um, sometimes even name people. Uh, in that village, uh, that town, um, it was an important person. Uh, they owned the mill. They were the, uh, uh, the the head person running the town. And you might find um, that one of your ancestors was something more than just a peasant, because they were they were listed here uh, in some some role of some kind. And I'll also tell you where the post office is. Um, where the nearest train station is. There's a lot of other interesting information that uh, can be included in the different uh, descriptions. Um, one key though is many, many, much more than in, in English, many, many villages have the same name or uh, the same name with an addition to it. So there are many villages where there's 100, 200, 300 of them in Poland, all with the same name. Um, they're taken from uh, a tree or uh, a type of tree or uh, a landmark of some kind that would have been common and therefore uh, has been repeated. Or it might have an addition. So it might be upper or lower X, uh, new or old X. Um, so you do have to be careful uh, when um, you know, looking at these things to make sure you're zooming in on the right town if you happen to have one of these uh, common ones. Now, there are those who only have three or four maybe, and there's, there are many unique ones as well, but uh, just a warning that you do have to make sure you have the right village for, for various names. Gazetteers also come in, uh, uh, into importance here. A gazetteer is essentially a listing of locations. And with regard to the villages and so forth, it will give the names of the villages in alphabetical order, but then it'll also tell you what um, Voivod it happens to be in, like one of our states, the Powiat, which is like one of our counties, maybe even the Gmina, which is a little, uh, let's call it a township, uh, possibly in, in terms of our terminology, uh, at least geographically. So if you do have one of these villages that has uh, multiple locations, and you know that your ancestors came from... Um, Northeastern Poland or from uh, Pomosia, Pomerania, look for those that are in those areas. You can eliminate all of those that are from Southern Poland or, 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 or uh, from uh, some other area distant or Central Poland or near Warsaw or something like that. So the gazetteers would be very helpful in this regard. Um, 
And then also through the partitioning, as I mentioned here, many villages and towns, um, especially in Germany, but also in Russia, had a different name. Sometimes those names are very similar, uh, just spelled slightly differently. Uh, so the Polish and the German, uh, the sound it could be almost the same. So you got that familiarity, but rather than using SZ in German to be SCH and, and so forth. However, you are going to find, again, complete differences. So the Polish city in southwestern Poland, great place to visit, Wrocław, was for a long period of time the German city of Breslau. Um, totally unrelated name there, but others will be very similar. There are lists online that give you a um, combination where you can go in and say, I have the Polish name, what's the German name? Or the other way around, what's the German name? Uh, and they'll give you the Polish name, same thing with Russian. And the German would apply to the Austro-Hungarian uh, portion of Southern Poland as well, because German would have been the language uh, down there. Speaking of language, when you get into the records, you're gonna be dealing with uh, Polish, German, Latin, and Russian. The oldest records would be in Latin. Then you start seeing Polish. Then during the partitions, you're gonna have German and Russian. Uh, after the partitions, you're back to Polish. Um, but you are going to have to deal with, with the other languages. The Russian, of course, is the most difficult, uh, basically because uh, it's in Cyrillic, but not only that, it's in Cyrillic uh, cursive. So, you know, I may know, and you may know the most of the Russian alphabet that you always see in capital letters. You know, a lot of it's very similar to Greek as well as Latin, but once you get into the cursive, I have no idea what that person is writing. So that does take some extra work. A couple of German scripts can be difficult to read uh, in, uh, in cursive, but most of the time it's pretty clear. The Polish and Latin are, are quite straightforward. I've never really had too much problem there other than penmanship, which ranges from almost illegible to extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, they come in a columnar format, particularly uh, the German area. That's great. You just you, you know what the column headings are. You know what you're looking for. You scan for the names, the surnames, and so forth. It's quite straightforward. The Russian area, in particular, use the uh, Napoleonic formulaic form, so it's a long, long paragraph. The advantage to that, though, is you get a lot of information. They will talk about their occupations. They will talk about the relationships of uh, the godparents or the um, uh, best man and so forth and what their occupations were and where they were from. So um, you gain and you lose. Uh, it, it's more difficult with which to work unless you can find and uh, work with someone who can read the Russian Cyrillic uh, cursive. But boy, you can really gain a lot of information about the people, uh, much more than just in a column. Uh, another publication of ours uh, from our store is In Their Words. And we have four volumes, each of the languages above. Each is a very thick book. Um, I've got one in front of me here. It's the Polish one. It's uh, almost 400 pages, soft cover. But I'll tell you, it's, it's really great if you're really getting deep into all kinds of records, not just the vital records, but all kinds of records. It goes through them, shows examples, does translations, gives you the exceptions and the variations uh, and so forth. Uh, it really, really is uh, for someone who's dealing a lot with uh, other kinds of records, um, you know, a, a resource that you can move up to. And um, here are two translators that you can use. Translate on Google and DeepL do a pretty good job. Um, you know, either typing it in or if you uh, have it in a format where you can uh, copy and paste, it'll take that too. But uh, to work with the Polish, uh, Russian, German, et cetera, uh, those are two translation sites on the web, you know, free of charge. Okay, research avenues for Poland. We'll talk about the uh, searchable databases on the internet, other internet data sources, a little bit about Polish archives, and working with researchers. So let's start with uh, the searchable databases. You know, I spent 
many, many, many hours going through miles and miles and miles of um, Mormon microfilms at the Family History Center. Now all of that is online at uh, familysearch.org. Uh, it's you know a superb resource. Um, and with that, and then later with development of the sites in Poland, I have done virtually all of my research from home. Um, yes, I had to drive a half an hour to the family search location, but now everything is right out of my house. Um, it's free. It's extensive. Of course, you need to know the parish, you know, village. So uh, you can access the records by the parish. More and more items are coming out all the time. And um, if you don't have a family history center near you, on their site, you can find uh, an affiliate library. More and more libraries are becoming affiliates, which gives them access to the online records. Why is that important? It's because not everything is viewable from home. In Poland, this is particularly true of Southern Poland, the Galician area. Uh, depending on the nature of the contract when they made the microfilms, and now also the privacy laws in uh, the European Union, sometimes you'll see the little uh, image with a key on top of it. That means you can't get it from home. But many of those, good, actually quite good number of those, most of those, uh, are able to be viewed at the Family History Center or the Affiliate Library which is considered part of the Family History Center uh, program, I guess. However, in addition to that, there are still are some of uh, uh, microfilm reels online that cannot be viewed uh, over the internet. Um, some of this really has to do with Europe. If you've got a, a microfilm reel that's uh, 17 and 1800s, but for some reason there's, there's a little part on there that's 1950s or 1940s, uh, if that's not accessible under under EU rules now of privacy, the whole reel is unav unavailable. So, um, but most things are viewable either from home and those that are from home, most of those can be seen at the History Center or the Affiliate Library. But that's the greatest place to start. From there, you can always work with uh, Salt Lake City to see if they can you know, access the records, if they could make you a copy, et cetera. Uh, searchable databases. Uh, the top line I have there is uh, a group that uh, provides a lot of aid, um, and they have in information on different kinds of internet tools, different collections, uh, an outline of the Polish archives, they call it Polish archives in a nutshell, and uh, some of the projects that are going on. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a nice research site to have um, to check just in case you have questions or problems, it's a good place to start. What I want to do is show you a couple of the major Polish sites. In the last 10 years or so, there's been a great, great increase in interest in genealogy in Poland. And um, they have been creating some fantastic websites, uh, databases, constantly adding it to it. Millions of records are, are now up and running. Uh, most of these sites are quite intuitive. You don't need to know Polish. Some of them do have an English option, uh, or you can do a right click and on your on your screen and try out, you know, translate to English. Sometimes that'll work. But if not, it, usually it's pretty easy. You know a couple words for, you know, send or nazwisko for, for surname, things like that, and you can run with them. And here are really the key ones. Genoteca is really the, the home base for this. Metrica is part of that. They have a number of sub uh, groups. The Jewish Gen uh, is, is also excellent. Uh, even if you're not Jewish, it, it has some good informational um, access points there that can be helpful. Uh, if you come from uh, Poznań province in Western Poland, uh, the first major website was the Poznań project. It uh, put up um, every marriage that they could find in Poznań province uh, in the 19th century. It was very helpful for me to get to get going on things. Uh, PTG is another one, Pomerania and so forth. 
Uh, there's there's a good number of these. As I say, there's even more on our website. Uh, when you go there, you go to uh, searchable databases, click on Poland, and you'll you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. Let me give you an example here of internet searchable databases using uh, your first stop, Ganateca. Uh, here's the home page. Um, I and you'll see the here they do have the Polish and uh, British British and American combination flag. So you click on that and you get the English version. You choose the Voivod state in Poland, and they do have some things from Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine a little bit. You can see not quite as much, but it's getting there. I mean, they've got, you know, almost 2 million here from Ukraine, you know, Western Ukraine, a few from Lithuania and that. But you can see here, Mazovia, you know, major area, 10 million, 8 million in Łódź, et cetera. Um, there's, a, there's a, but, you know, Lubuskia is uh, kind of far behind, okay? Uh, it all depends how many volunteers they have and where they're focusing. But, you know, we're talking about at the time I took this picture, um, just under 50 million records. So you can choose a spot. And uh, I have here Podlaskia. I'm going to do all locations. If you, you, you can actually choose a parish if you want to, or if you know it's focused. I put in the last name with the correct Polish spe spelling. Uh, you can put the first names if you want. I just always start with the last one. Um, unless you're a Jankowski or, or or one of those where there are going to be a lot of them. I know one of the, you know, Smith types of names. You can do an exact search as you want. I start with, you know, anything close. You can put a range if you want. I like to start with, you know, everything open, you know, laid on me kind of thing. You'll see here you've got tabs for births, marriages, and deaths. And... I've got at least 18 pages of Pianchikovsky. Some of them will be a little bit off, perhaps, uh, because I don't I didn't hit exact search. But even with exact search, it's going to be a, a reasonable number because we're looking at, you know, 300 years of um, of records that they they've got here. And um, so I got the parish, the various towns, and um, last name for the uh, the births. Father's name, he's going to be a Pianchikovsky, and then you've got the mother's surname. But you'll see also here that sometimes the surnames of the women are Pianchikovsky as well. So, as you know, uh, it only takes a small number of generations and the power of two to have more people, uh, you know, than, than ever existed on the planet Earth, um, you know, generation wise. So, in, in villages, you know, third, fourth, fifth cousins who are ultimately marrying each other. Um, now, I wanted to indicate uh, something interesting here on the town you may have seen. I've got the town of Flashes, and I've got the town of Rams. Now, what sense does that make? Well, remember, I clicked English. So the, the name of this town is a word for flashes or lightning or something. And this, the name of this town in Polish is actually the word for rams. So be careful if you go to English, if it's translatable, it will translate it, even if it's the town. So you might want to look at both, or, or if you find one of these weird things and you think it's your, uh, your family member, go back to the Polish, check out what the name of the town is. So that's, whenever you do that, whenever you go to English, you, you have to remember it's going to translate um, any kind of word into English if it can translate it. It could be the, the name of a place. It could be the name of a, a business. It could be a geographical uh, entity. Um, if one of these was a Dolny something, it would probably say lower or something like that. So um, be aware of, of how translations work. But as you can see, you've got plenty of information. I've got the year. So rather than having nowadays going through in the like past days, going through miles of tape, miles of microfilm, uh, hopefully not missing anything. I can just go right to the year 1919 and then search through it. And, um, you know, I don't have to do the other 25 years I might've been looking through. Saves a little bit of work on the eyes. Here we are. So Flesha and Brana, that's, that's the original Polish. 
that gave us flashes and rams. And here's another flashes here, a couple more. So it's a popular town, flash. Um, and then by clicking here, you'll get uh, weddings and, and death. So marriages and death. And the marriages will have, you know, both uh, spouses on there as well. And sometimes the parents. Uh, here's the Posenine project. So uh, again, very, uh, there is an English version and it's very straightforward. You can put in one name, maybe have both names, a um, couple different options here on matching. You know, I start with the simplest and get everything I can. And I had a Johannes Teske and Mariana Samolinska. It's, I knew they were from Poznan, but as I said earlier, I didn't know if they were from the city or if they were from the province because I had some family information, including Johannes was the uh, immigrant back just before the Civil War, like 1858, 1859. Uh, I have their, their, their marriage in Poland. And then a couple of years later, I had them on the Cincinnati uh, uh, census. And then later on, uh, they moved to Chicago. Um, so I put in what I had, but I had Teski, T-E-S-K-I, a Polish version. And that's why Mariana Somolinska comes up at 100% and he comes up at 83. And um, this helped me find out that he originally was from a German family that married some nice, attractive Polish girls. And uh, they finally changed the E to an I. And I have uh, the parents of both, which again helps me move backwards in time. So a uh, very good you know, uh, hit here, um, very easy to use. Importantly here, I found out that he's from Hojej. And it was 1855 that they were married, entry nine on that page. And look, and I also have Holjeshin and Kolmar, here's the German name, Kolmar for Holjesh, and sometimes it was also called this slightly, but it was also known a lot as Kolmar. So it's also giving me, and like this one here, uh, Chichanka, uh, Schrenlanka. So again, sounds similar, but you can see the difference in spelling, but here's the German word, same thing here. So it's a nice thing here, it's giving you the name of the, the, the German name for the city or town or village, uh, which is gonna be very helpful. You don't have to look for it someplace else. Uh, here's the Pomeranian General uh, uh, Genealogical Association. Uh, same type of thing. Uh, they've got uh, over 6 million records at this time. And uh, you, you go in and go to the databases and uh, you know, do the same, same thing. You know, births, marriages and deaths and just put in the names and so forth. So these are some of the really key ones to work with. Uh, here you can get it, you can change the English, German, Russian, and Polish. And you don't have to be a member to, to get in. I just use it straight out. Other internet data sources, uh, and you can look at these, uh, a good sampling of these uh, on our, our website. Um, there are maps, village locators, um, to find parishes and parish locations. I mentioned the uh, Swodnik uh, Geograficzna. There are others. Um, there's the Polish uh, genealogical societies, um, not only in the U.S., but the in Poland. Uh, they've been uh, creating in the last 10 years or so uh, local uh, genealogical societies. And an interesting one is surname distribution. You know, we talk about DNA and um, you know how this can help find you where you are, but the surnames can be helpful also. And here are, are two that you can work with. And so uh, one looked like this. You put in a surname and it says, I've got seven entries here, 27 south of Warsaw. As you zoom in on these, more dots will appear. So that uh, 17 might all of a sudden break into three or four dots with three here, five there. And then you can move all the way down and get the individual information. So it's a very interactive type of map um, that, that gives you an idea of, of, of where that surname happened to be, uh, which is very helpful. You can, here's, here's a high cluster, high cluster, high cluster. Okay, a couple low clusters. You know, if your family's from up here, hmm, 
do I have the wrong spelling or perhaps they moved? And this is all based on um, you know current information, current tax returns, things like that. Um, but if you said, oh, my family's from, they were from somewhere south of Warsaw. Well, nice cluster here worth investigating rather than running around to all these other spots, I would start there. Or maybe they were from down in Galicia. You knew they were from, from other information that they came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I would start down here. And uh, here's a different map uh, with Narloch, which actually could be a Scottish name. Narloch uh, is a North Lake, Loch and Nar. Uh, and there was a, 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 a swampy lake just below the castle in Edinburgh called Narloch. And of course, uh, after the Reformation, many Catholics in uh, England, Scotland, uh, and so forth, you know, uh, the British, uh, Great Britain uh, left because of persecution against uh, Catholics, and many of them did go to Poland. And um, yes, my family, uh, the Narlocks, are from this area. This area here, where there's the greatest cluster, and of course we can, you know, do some other other work with this. So going to a couple of sites, seeing how they're similar or different, um, and maybe some of the people came from over there, possibly, and went here, or maybe some of the people here went there. So uh, you may have thought, you know, maybe maybe your family did come from this area of Poland. Well, there are a couple of Narlocks out there, so maybe there was a family uh, that's related to me in that general area. So this is a nice way of trying to zoom in a little bit more. Of course, again, if 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 you've got a Kowalski or a Jankowski or a Vishnevsky, I mean, they're going to be all over um, with with that type of of name. I've got names where it's just one one or two spots, uh, not nearly this cluttered in in my family. The Pianchakowskis are are up in this area, for example, named after two towns, Pianchakovo and Pianchakovac. Shark eyes. Um, this is a presentation all in itself. They're not easy to use. A lot of it is not in English, or the English version is very abridged. Um, complicated, even if you start finding things, then to get to the right font, as they call it, the, the right group of records, and then trying to find the specific one uh, that's out there. Um, the, a couple of the key and important Polish uh, sites that I talked about, particularly Geneteca, is working with the government, working with the archives to try to get them to make it more user-friendly. They're, they're not that user-friendly. They're difficult to use, even for Polish people. Um, there is a lot of information there. Some things are not online yet. And this, this, this goes everywhere. It's, uh, you know, state reports, court cases, wills, inheritances, notary records, premarital agreements. There are tons of these documents out there, but they're still all bound up in the archives. You can go to Poland and, uh, and visit them uh, if you wish, especially if you speak Polish and have some idea on how to find the things. Or, of course, sometimes you can find the, the pointer to them, but you're, you're not going to find much in the way of these types of documents on uh online. In any case, this is more advanced anyway. Most people uh, are starting off just trying to find who their family was, how far can I get back, what are the relationships, you know, what history do we have there. Once you have all of that, then you can start trying to find out where did they live, did they own land, you know, were there any wills and inheritances. If there was someone of means, you know, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to have premarital agreements. Um, I need to look up uh, some lawsuits and some business agreements. One of my relatives up in Pomoja um, moved around a bit, but then he ended up in partnership with a few guys on a large farm. I know where it is. Uh, that a partnership after a few years fell apart. There was a lawsuit. Uh, then he bought a farm uh, from where my great-grandmother came from. Um, but uh, it would be very interesting to see if I can find the court case any notary records uh, dealing with uh, that uh, that partnership, maybe even tax records. But I'll have to go up there with uh, a Polish speaker I know who can really read Polish much better than I can, and and maybe a, uh, uh, I know one of the find one of the people up there who uh, really knows those types of records and just pay him to come along and and help me with it. Um, but it is sometimes very useful to and interesting to look at these kinds of records. Uh, in Lithuania, for example, 
uh, I found online uh, information dealing with the uh, Museum of Occupation, which starts with the Nazis and goes through the Soviet period. Uh, it's actually housed in, and I, I have visited it a couple of times, it's housed in the large building uh, that was the home base of the Lithuanian branch of the NKVD and KGB. And the uh, major mu the museum is uh, attached to it as well. And the archives, which were protected when Lithuania split away from the, the Soviet system, uh, were protected and saved. So I, I got some contact information, wrote a letter, uh, had a friend of mine who's Lithuanian, uh, translated the Lithuanian saying, uh, I have information because I learned from family over there that um, my uh, great uncle, as, as mentioned earlier, was sent to the Gulag under Stalin. Sent them the information I had and I got a letter back, not surprisingly in English, very good English, uh, that uh, they have the records. So they gave me the instructions of what to do to give them a heads up. So that uh, takes them a day or two to get the information together and, and uh, uh, the records pulled. I went down there um, on the language side. I worked a couple of times with the Ministry of Education. So a person there who, being an older individual, had to take Russian as a child, you know, was very good at Russian. And we went down there together and um, I got you know, 30 some pages of everything from the order to go uh, arrest um, my great uncle and uh, what he had on him, all his charges. I know the people who fingered, fingered him for not being a good uh, Soviet uh, tovarich, a Soviet comrade, um, a bunch of stuff on his trial. And then finally, a couple pages of all of the legal code that he violated all the way through to his deportation papers to the Gulag. So um, those kinds of records are there but that's not the type of thing you're going to find online. So um, as I say, there's there are things out there on the web, other places. We even had a, a couple of times our webinars talking about how to use the archives in Poland. Uh, they're just not that easy. So, But you can go in and, and try it. And then uh, Catholic archives, uh, Catholic church archives are at the, the both the diocesan and the archdiocesan uh, levels. Some of it is getting online, but the church is very protective of this stuff. Uh, many a priest will slam the door in your face politely, sometimes not so politely. I don't have time for this. These people are dead. They're gone. I've got other things to do. Others um, are very happy and, and sometimes excited. I, I, I met with a priest in a town that was a family ancestral village, and he was so excited that someone from Chicago would come looking for uh not only the records, but any uh, existing relatives. And sure enough, after 125 years, I made connection with some cousins over there and uh, have visited them a couple of times. So you never know what uh, the attitude of the priest is going to be. Or you knock on the door the next day, a different priest answers, and uh, you'll get a totally different response. The first one may have been, uh, you know, showing you away. The second one is welcome you or vice versa. And then you can always work with a uh, professional researcher. Um, you know, they know the language or languages. They know how to work with the archives. They can physically visit the archives. They can physically visit the parishes and villages. Uh, they have access to more types of documents. Um, for very southeastern Poland uh, near Zezhuf, um, the relationship we have is with uh, a, a person and his partner are the only two researchers that they will allow into the archives. They won't allow visitors and they don't allow other, other archivists or, or uh, you know, researchers to go in, just these two guys. If you wish, some will, can attempt to locate relatives and some of them also uh, can assemble, organize and lead a personal tour. We've used several of these for the tours that we've put together uh, genealogy tours to different partitions, but they'll also be happy to do one-on-one uh, -on -one or a small family uh, and uh, take you around, make all the arrangements. So if you also want to go and visit uh, the family uh, history, family villages, the parish, uh, look at the, the baptismal font that your great or great, great uh, grandparents were baptized in, where they were married, etc. Maybe the train station that uh, 
there were a few tears shed when the young ones left for America. Um, you know, they'll be happy to do that. Some of them will do that as well. They do a very good job. We get a lot of you know, all positive responses from anyone who's worked with them. So uh, in the research uh, sources section of our website, you go to that tab, scroll down. There's a section there that is uh, researchers and tour guides in Poland. You can look through it. It has their information, a little bit about what if they specialize in any particular regions and um, you know how, how they can help, whether they do the tours or not, and so forth. And then uh, you know their contact information, phone, email, uh, website, et cetera. And of course, there are the societies. And um, I went through a lot of what uh, we as a society do as the Polish General Agro Society of America. So we have both member and uh, public sections on our website, as you know, typically is the case. Um, we have a lot of uh, pointers to all kinds of vital records, archives, databases, libraries. Uh, we've got map resources, you know, everything I've talked about, how we're building more how-to gu how -to guidance. Um, our uh, quarterly webinars, actually this year uh, is going to be five. Uh, this uh, Saturday, tomorrow, we have a special uh, presentation by a young lady from uh, uh, the, the Mormons in Salt Lake talking about some of the recent and upcoming new things on family search. You, know, you can go to our site and, and join that if you like. And then, you know, we do publish books and publications. We also sell uh, some nice publications from uh, authors in genealogy that are uh, appropriate for, you know, Polish and, and, and so forth uh, work and general work. Uh, our quarterly journal of uh, 32 pages uh, is, uh, you know, jam-packed with information, uh, stories, uh, helps on the research, et cetera. Uh, I mentioned our quarterly meetings, and you can look at um, a history of those that we have uh, in the past, uh, so you can get an idea of what's what's there. And we will do some limited research. Our, our prime role is to point people in the direction, to help them in their research and, um, you know, where they can find things, who they can work with, et cetera. But there are certain things we can do a little bit beyond that. Um, some of those are, are archives that uh, we, we created, the indexes for uh, the obits in the Genek Gigagoski in Chicago, for example. Uh, and we have access to all of those, those records. Um, the PGSA, uh, the P, uh, uh, not the PGSA, the uh, PRCUA, the Insurance uh, uh, Fraternity Organization. Um, not only do we have the index, but with that index, we can dig up the... Uh, the records we have you know most of the records not all of them but most of them either in physical form or or in digital form that we can reference and uh then of course is in we have polls were all over the country they have it's not just chicago or illinois we have people who are you know members of that bought insurance you know from wisconsin pennsylvania wherever it might be uh so that that covers a large area of the country where where polls happen to be uh, uh, uh settled so uh, that gives you a little idea of, of our, our membership. And, um, you know, we do, do have a, a growing uh, list of things that we're always adding. If on the front page you go to uh, news and updates, you'll see the last year or so, every month we're adding, you know, two, three, sometimes four new things to the website. So we're constantly growing the uh, records and resources and, and pointers that can be helpful to you in your Polish research. And so with that, thank you very much. Um, here's our website, a uh, couple of uh, emails if you want to email us. And as I say, I, I ran through a lot of things, but you will have uh, this recording uh, to refer to in future. You can go to our website, see other things. And uh, I wish you good luck on your, uh, your detective work in the uh, area of Polish uh, genealogical research. So with that, uh, Suzanne, do we have any questions? Yes, I'm looking in the chat box right now. Uh, Dorothy says, is your Polish ancestors, uh, if your Polish ancestors lived in the Prussia partition of Poland, this may interest you. On Friday, October 6th from 12.30 to 2.30, the ABCs of the Old German Script by Charlotte Noel, uh, hosted by EGS German Interest Group. And then she put the link into the chat box. So if anyone's interested in that, it's there in the chat box.
Yes, that would be good. Dude. You know, everyone might be familiar with Fraktur. Uh, that's the German script you usually see in printed documents. But the cursive, there are a couple of them that uh, it just looks like up and down lines. It looks more like a graph. It's very difficult to read. And there are one or two others, depending on the area in Germany. Um, but of course, even though a certain script might have been used in the Rhine Valley, that's not to say a priest from the Rhine Valley ended up being um, a priest sent over to, to the German area of Poland, and he's going to write in that type of script. So that that's great, yeah. Uh, Dorothy also went on to say that she uh, would like to learn more about what happened to the church rec records taken by German, by Germany. Um, most records are still in Poland. Uh, it's the Russians who took and tended to keep. Um, uh, everything I found was by going to the Polish sources. And if you're on family search, um, I'm not quite sure, but most of them were from the Polish parishes, but they could have found those records in a German archive and filmed them there, but they would still be found under the village parish in Poland. Uh, some records have been returned. Um, you know, people talk about records lost. It's a, it's really the other way around. It's, it's how rare records are lost. Uh, not every parish church burned down. A lot of priests will say, well, the church burned down in 1862 or 1892 or 1922 or whatever. You know, it didn't or yeah, it did. But the priest still saved the records. You know, during the wars, they would wrap them up in oilcloth and other things and bury them and save them. It's it's very interesting as to how much really continues to exist out there. Uh, but you can go to German archive sources and see if there are things there. A cousin of mine was doing some genealogical research. Uh, he's in uh, Northern Poland. And he had gotten uh, some information that he uh, had to go to, uh, it was the archives in Brandenburg or something. I can't remember where it was. But he actually got the information from Germany. They had it. Uh, however, uh, with that information that he had told me about, there was something I hadn't found yet, a particular individual. Um, I went to the Mormon site, I went to the town, and I had the record. I found the record. They had it. The difference is he got a typed, formatted, this is what the record holds. I brought him a copy of the actual original record. So um, they, they may not give you uh, the record, but, but they, they can give you the information on it. But he was really thrilled to actually see the, the, the church record itself. Uh, Connie would like to know, even though uh, we definitely appreciate you allowing us to record the presentation, but she'd like to know if you could provide the slides to the class. Uh, yeah, I, I, could, I could send you the, the PDF, sure. I, I, don't, I don't see a problem with that, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, then I'll just send it off. It's, it's no start. different than being on a recording. So yeah, I can send it off. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, Dorothy wanted to, she continued on with another comment. She says, PTG and Stanley Freimark have not found the early 1800 records for the parish of Lip, I hope I pronounce this right, Lipslutz, L-I-P-U-S-Z. L-I-P-U-S-Z. Uh -huh. Lipush. Okay. Lipush. Okay. Um, well, you know, there are a lot of places out there. They're doing a great job. You know, as we saw, they had, you know, almost 50 million records. I bet you there's another 50 million that can be put up. <laughs> um, maybe they just haven't gotten to them. Um, but it is all volunteer work. Uh, so, uh, but they're, they're plugging away. Um, what you can do is what I do every now and then, even for things that I have found, for my family is I will go back every now and then and just do another search and see what might pop up. Or um, I keep a record of where um, there might be a hole. So maybe they have um, 1820 to 1889. So I'm going to look and see, did something come up now before 1820? Or maybe they have, you know, 1780 to 1805 and then 1820. Okay, I'm going to look for and see uh, is 1805 to 1820 now in there or parts of it. So it is every every month, every week, there's there's stuff going on uh, and being added. 
it never hurts to go back and check again. And that's why I'll do those big blanket searches. And then I'll scroll down and, and look for the years and see if there are any holes that I have in my notes that weren't out there at that time, see if they've been filled. Uh, Judy made a comment. She said, I noticed the name Michael Ozinski on one of the slides as father of Marie Augusti Ozinski. I have a Michael Ozinski who lived in New Jersey, who was a brother-in-law of my great grandfather. Haven't been able to trace him back. Okay, well, <laughs> this was on the Geneteca. Did you see it here somewhere? What was the name again? Oh. Uh, spelled O-S-I-N-S-K-Y. Oh, okay, okay. So it's probably not on this. Ah, here we are. Marie Augusta Oshinsky, born 1865. Okay. And there's a father and mother. Yeah. Well, that's on um, Pose Nine's search program, you know, the Nine Project. And uh, and you can just Google Pose Nine Project and it'll you'll usually find it. And um, so we, it, it, here's a place to start. You know, go to Anatika, okay, Poznan's in Wielkopolska, which is a, a good popular one. And, um, and then, you know, do a search and see what you come up with. It might, might be a relative. Uh, let me check one other thing. Okay, there were, okay, there were, you know, maybe, I, I'm looking in uh, one of our publications, Polish Surnames, Origins and Meanings. It's a nice big book. And um, it probably comes from a town or something, either Oshina, Oshina, Oshno. Uh, and there are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 13 to 16,000 entries with that name. So, wow. It's not rare, but it certainly is not, um, you know, a, a huge number of names. It's not two or three hundred, but it's not. Uh, I mean, it's up there, but it's not uncommon. But it's not, you know, fifty or a hundred thousand or something like that either. So I'll give you a little possibility of uh, again someone named after a uh, a village that they uh, happen to live in. But yeah, I would start there. See, do and I would do a search just on the last name, and that would pull up all kinds of Oshinskis, and um, you know, then work from there. Because then you would get males and females, husbands and wives, and um, you know, from all ages in the 19th century. You might you might have come across something. She says, "Great, thank you." She will do. Okay. And then Connie put in the chat box my paternal. Grandmother was an Inda, which goes back some time uh, to the same surname into 1817 and then stops. Found other names, Johann von Inden, back to 1525. Okay, so, so what were the, the two names? Uh, Inda, I N D A. Yeah, interesting. And then the other one was uh, Johann von Inden, spelled I N D E N. I N D E N? Uh huh. Hmm. And with a Vaughn in there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, of course, Va depending on the record you're looking at, Vaughn is usually attached to someone, um, you know, in the the noble or gentry class in German. Um, in in Polish records, you'll see uh, nobilis in Latin, um, other types of of, of things. Uh, but of course. The problem also is if you're getting a record from from Germany, it it means from, so uh, that they, they may not be noble um, or of a knightly class. It may just mean they're from uh, a certain certain town or something like that. Um, in the that's interesting. That that is a strange uh, Polish name. I'm just going to do a quick look here. Well, at least it's, you know, I, I know the word that's going to say is, uh, at least it's not Indic. That's the word for Turkey. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay. 
Um, okay, here, this is, okay, here we go. Uh, here's what it says. Uh, it, the root is I-N-D, origin unclear, perhaps from the given name Indre, a variant of Andre, or from uh, nouns beginning with I-N-D, such as Indic, um, but they do have Inda, I-N-D-A, 155, and then uh, uh, 147 Indeka, I-N-D-E-K-A, uh, Indelak, Indua. So all of these, and, and, and those two were under 100. So this is a very unusual name, as I figured. But not only that, uh, no matter what comes after the root, there, there are very few names here. So, um, you know, this is one that you might want to search by uh, IND and don't make it specific, just make it general, but also start your searches with that and see what you might come up with. Um, but at least, you, at least you, this, this is a name that is very, very uh, unusual and uh, rare. So that should be helpful. Uh, uh, she has uh, another. She has another last name too. Poznan. Uh, P O Z N A N. Oh well, that Poznan is the city. Poznan. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Posen in German. P O S E N. Posen in German. Poznan in Polish. Um, make sure when you're looking at uh, that record that it's not an indication of where that person was from. It's unusual to find uh, someone, you know, for example, uh, I've never heard anybody talk about something on the order of a Jan Warszawa, you know, John Warsaw. <laughs> you know, I mean, the big cities tend not to have, um, you know, uh, people take their names from big cities. Uh, it could happen. There's no rule against it. It would be highly unusual, but um, it might be an indicator of, you know, they're saying, you know, Jan from Poznan and maybe did not give uh, the surname. Okay, there's another question in the chat box. Randall, this is a little off um, genealogy, but he'd like to know if you happen to know if the Lithuanian Plaza in Chicago is still there. The Lithu Lithuanian Plaza? Plaza? Yeah. He said it was uh, at one time it was in Chicago between 69th and 70th East Side. Oh, well, there's the uh, Belzacus Museum uh, and Cultural Center uh, down, uh, you know, near Midway Airport. Um, whether or not there's a plaza, I don't I don't I don't know. I know there's also a monument to a couple of uh, Lithuanian uh early uh, air raiders who died in a plane crash um, crossing the ocean and, and stuff. But no, the Belzacus, um, you know, cultural center, museum and so forth uh, is still in existence. Uh, Stanley died a couple of years ago. I knew Stanley well. And because uh, I, I did some things with them because of my you know connection with Lithuania. Um, um, they could help you with, you know, anything else that, uh, you know, about the, the neighborhood down there. Of course, that neighborhood has changed. It's not nearly as Lithuania. The Lithuanians have moved out to uh, uh, Lamont in the far southwest side of uh, the distant suburbs of Chicago. Uh, out there also is the uh, Lithuanian World something. I forget the whole name of it. Uh, the, I think it's like the Lithuanian World Center. So if you Google that or Google Balzakis, I think it's B-A-L-Z-E-K-A-S, um, and then call them up and, you know, they should be able to help you. But, okay. but that museum is, that museum and, and um, you know, Lithuanian organization is still there. Uh, the newspaper, the Lithuanian language newspaper headquarters is not far from there. That's still in existence. They still publish that. Okay, well, I'm waiting for a few more questions to come in. I've got a couple. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that the that the priests were very good about wrapping the records uh, in oil cloth to keep them from being destroyed or stolen. Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of any particular record sets that were destroyed? No, uh, I I don't know of any any record uh, or location where you can go and say, oh, these don't exist. You know what I mean? Um, if they don't exist, uh, either a no one's ever done that work. Uh, it's kind of a backwards thing, you know, how, how are you going to, 
you know, if it doesn't, there's no sign that says, oh, by the way, this doesn't exist. You know what I mean? And I don't know of anyone who's ever started to collect these things or ask people to say, look, if you if you happen to know that a records do not exist, you know, send them in and we'll put them out there. Um, and there are records that, you know, you can't find, but they do exist. They could be out of order. They could be buried in a uh, uh, an archive somewhere. Um, the priests, for example, are just like here, are after X number of years, 25 or 50 years, supposed to send the books into the Archdiocesan Archive. When I was in Lubihovo, uh, visiting, um, you know, finding out my relatives up there, visiting with the priest who was able to uh, find my cousins up there, uh, he was so excited, he took me in his office, and he still had the books from the teens and the 20s. And uh, some of them had been uh, filmed by the Mormons. Um, I'm not sure. I, I didn't have to go through all of them, and I wasn't going to do a, a checklist on it. Uh, but it's quite possible that uh, if you were to look for certain books, the, the uh, Mormons might not have them. Uh, and the reason is that uh, they're just hidden away. Uh, the priest wouldn't let them in. That's a case very often. The priest will let them in the, to copy any books. Uh, or at that time, they only copied a few of them. The other ones were hidden or they didn't, they weren't found. So there, it's really difficult to, to know what doesn't exist. You can only go by what you can find. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, you had mentioned the list of equivalent names. Uh, what recommendation would you give the class for doing a keyword search on the internet to find an equivalent name uh, cheat sheet, so to speak? Oh, oh, okay. Um, um uh, i think we've we've got some things on our website uh i do have a lot of things out there that deal with um names and that um uh i'm trying to think offhand uh you know there's so much floating around that i usually have to go to my records <laughs> but i can uh, let me do this let me add that to sending the slides um First, it's, I, I think you're looking at the first names. Correct? You're looking at uh, people's first names? Um, I think it was also towns, wasn't it? I think you're, one of your slides... Oh, the towns, yeah. Oh, the towns, okay, and towns, yes, and towns. Uh, I can send I can send the uh, links, the URLs for those to you with the other stuff, and then you can share it with everyone. Oh, That'd be you. the easiest, yeah. Okay. Uh, There's one that's actually... There's one that's actually for the German, that's actually a German site, I believe. And so they have the German Polish and then another version for the Polish German. So sometimes a few things like that, um, you know, the other country uh, is a good place to look. Okay. Uh, Randall, I see you have your hand up. Did you have another question? Was it for me, Suzanne? Yeah, I see you, your hand is up on the on the screen. Yeah, well, the reason why I'm asking, I'm really kind of curious about the Lithuanian neighborhood on the south side. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that's where I grew up. Okay. And I found out, oh, probably a couple decades ago, that monument to the uh, Lithuanian av aviators was torn down and destroyed. Um, I noticed all the families I knew in that area had all left there because of the crime and the corruption and the total change. Um, I noticed uh, the high school that used to be there, uh, um, Maria High School, was shut down and was taken over by another group. Um, I'm, I'm just finding there's nothing left in that area at all. And I was just kind of curious. Oh, okay. Well, um, it wasn't that many years ago that I was down there um, and I had some people from Lithuania and another time I had actually my cousin come over. Um, it turns out he's the most popular children's author in Lithuania. So I worked with the uh, consulate here and, and in Detroit and had him visit some of the Lithuanian communities in both those cities. And I took them to the aviator statue. It was there. And uh, so as far as I know, that still is down there. Uh, I don't know why they would have torn it down. Um, yes, a lot of high schools, a lot of schools, the Chicago schools have closed uh, either from the school side. And of course, the Catholic Church has closed a lot. Um, I don't know. There aren't that many. The last I was looking, there aren't that many 
Lithuanian restaurants or bakeries left anymore. The community has basically shifted itself almost due west to look to the Lamont area. And um, so there isn't much of a, a remnant of, of any neighborhood there and so forth. Um, but but the Balzacus Museum is still there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. Cause Mon yeah, Monument used to be at the corner of 69th and California, mm -hmm. right there on the corner. Okay. And uh, uh, the recent pictures I received from back there shows that it was no longer there. Hmm. Unless they, you know, unless they moved it to Lamont, I don't know. Um, for example, uh, a long time ago, 100 years ago or whatever, a, a big statue of uh, Kosciuszko was in the Humboldt Park. Um, well, that area, you know, is, is very uh, Latino now. And some years ago, they moved it out to uh, the extension of the land that goes out to the... Uh, uh, the uh, well, uh, the, just beyond the aquarium, out to the planetarium. And so there's the Kosciuszko statue and a big statue of uh, uh, Copernicus. Of course, Copernicus is right by the uh, the planetarium being uh, astronomy. So so it, it could have been moved. It could have been moved. If they, you know, uh, you know, they moved the Polish one, they could very easily have moved uh, the Lithuanian one. I uh, just haven't seen anything about it. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and Dorothy put into the chat box that um, I get. I think this is probably in relation to the uh, the town names we were just talking about. She says if you go to Kartenmeister, that's spelled yes. K E R T E N M E I S T E R dot mm -hmm. com, it has German Polish towns. Right, that's that's the one. I, the main one I was thinking of from Germany, Kartenmeister, and um, they they have two sets. They have German to Polish and Polish to German. Excellent. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Um, I have some many questions here. Um, you mentioned the Parish Jubilee books. Um, yes. Does your organization have those, or where can the students access them? Okay. If you go to our site and you go to uh, databases and so forth, um, you will find out there we do have indexes for uh, the Janek Chikagoski obits, uh, a lot of other things, one of which is, well, two of them I should mention. One is the Jubilee books. And they're not just from Chicago, they're from around the country. Uh, of course, not everyone and every issue, but there's a very good number of them out there. Um, you, can, you can do some searching with that and see what they have. Uh, and we also have uh, put together the index of the um, papers for the men who served, applied for, and served in Haller's army in, in the First World War. Both of those, we have the indexes, the Polish Museum of America have in their archives the documents. So whereas the obits and the PRCUA and a few other things, we have the uh, indexes and we can provide you with the documents, in those two cases, we have the index, but you ordered the documents from the museum. And uh, the forms to order all, all this stuff is, is on the site as well. So that, that it's very easy to do. Um, but uh, yeah, that can give you an idea of uh, what's out there. And, uh, you know, if you know a parish, um, you know, they would then, you know, look at look in and see if there's that name comes up and, uh, you know, make a copy for you. That's done by their archives and library. So we work our our uh, our little desk area and so forth, uh, and our mail goes to the same address. It's inside the uh, uh, the Polish Museum of America, which is inside the building of the the PRCUA. So it's like a a trushka doll. You know, it's one side of another one inside of another one. Okay. Well, I'm waiting for the the students to put any last uh, questions they might have into the chat box. Mm -hmm. Um, does your organ? I know you said that you have a bookstore uh, for your organization, uh, but do you also sell on Amazon, or is it only through your bookstore online? Uh, our books are only on uh, our site. Okay. And yeah. do you have to be a member to buy books? No, no. If you're, if you're a member, you get ten percent off. Okay, great. And speaking of your website, uh, did you want to uh, stop sharing your your PowerPoint and maybe go over the website just so we can kind of give you a plug on how to join? Oh, sure. Let me, uh, let's see. Let me, so here's our site. 
And there's, there's a, not much down below. Let me keep it simple. There's some membership stuff. And then you can always go to contact us. And I got a list of uh, emails and so forth. Um, you can click here to learn more about us. Uh, here's where I said news and update. And you can see all the things, you know, for a little over a year, the last year or so that we've been adding. And in some cases, you know, it's more than one thing. I mean, right here, I added about, you know, eight or nine different websites or uh, indexes and so forth. Um, uh, membership. And here's our bookstore. And, you know, we've got books, CDs, some syllabi, a couple DVDs, got some original Polish uh, posters, um, you know, a number of different things. Uh, here you can see our calendar of events coming up. Uh, and this is the next webinar, which is tomorrow. And we're always looking for volunteers. Okay. So surname databases. Um, U.S., Poland really have a lot of items. Lithuania, a little bit. Ukraine, a little bit. Russia, Belarus, much less. Um, hard to get. A lot of the stuff is, is, is in Russian or Ukrainian or Belarusian. Uh, and, um, and they aren't as big in genealogy. But, uh, you know, the U.S. side, got all this national stuff. And then here, for example, of the death claim index for PRCOA 1908 to 1947. Then we've got some other ones here for you know, members can get into also for the White Eagle Association and uh, and the like. Uh, some cemeteries, you know, some of the things, you know, like, you know, billion graves, find a grave. Uh, and then by city and state, state and city. Indiana, you know, where polls are, we're always building this as well. Um, if you know of any sites that are Polish oriented in uh, Nevada or that, you know, let me know. Let me know. We can put them up there. Um, but on the Polish side, here's Genoteca, Metrica. Uh, here's some stuff to the archives. Here's some things on nobility and gentry. But these are searchable, again, indexes. So you could see if maybe some of your family was there. But of course, you may have the same name as a Polish gentry, uh, Szlachta in Polish. Uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, you're, you know, you weren't a peasant. <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of good sites here that cross over Poland. And then here are a good number of sites by region. So near Augustów up in the Northeast, Galicia down in the South, Mała Polska, smaller Polska, uh, Poland, uh, Podlasi, da -da -da, Pomerania. Here's the Poznań project, you know, so a bunch of those. These are a couple of special indexes that uh, we uh, we put together, and then particular cities have um, you know indexes of various kinds, uh, cemeteries, uh, Jewish areas, military. So we, we're we're always building. So this this covers a lot of ground, a lot of ground. <laughs> And then since we have someone who's from the Lithuanian neighborhood, uh, we got a couple of things. Not a lot, but a couple of things. Our resource, uh, our research section here, um, family search, which I've talked about. <clears throat> to make it easy, I've got the direct link to their Wikipedia. So you go here, they, you've got even more information. Okay, how to locate, da da da. da. Um, there's a good amount of information and then you can click on different things here. So, um, you know, one stop and, and you're off and running. Uh, let's see, I got a, the control bars in the way on my site here. Let me get rid of that. And so you got those, uh, archives. So not only do we have the first archive there, we got some specialized archives, uh, military, um yeah it's it's at the church archives um so so this of course you know polish archives national archives some of these pages from there you can get to all the regional ones so just like you know in chicago there's the regional office of the national archives out by you there's probably a couple of them for california and, and other states the same thing here 
uh, but we'll be adding you know some breakdown on uh, on those. But again, they're, they're they're typically difficult to use. Um, here is a slow one, but here are a number of uh, genealogical societies: Polish or Czech and Slovak. Um, you know, a couple of these uh, in the United States and then internationally. Um, yeah, you know, those are those are listed in the Polish section, and then uh, here's uh, Lithuanian Global Society and some Canadian ones. But here are other international. Oh, I have to take California off. California uh, shut down earlier this year. A lot of stuff with geography. You know, we've got thirteen gazetteers, a bunch of maps. You know, other things for different kinds of searches for villages, parishes, uh, and so forth. Um, Polish churches in the United States. You know libraries, museums, newspapers. Here's the one on researchers. So see, there's a good list of people here, uh, but just, just you know, Polish origins is a major one. So they've been around a while. They're out of Krakow. Uh, Zenon's the key contact, uh, you know, all, all of the contact information, uh, but it's, it's same things for everyone, you know, but uh, they toured with us on uh, some of our, uh, par partnered with us on some of our tours. Uh, he'll cover you know, pretty much all of Poland, but also some of the other uh, adjoining countries, and then some of the additional services that they have. Uh, genealogy tour. He's out of Wrocław in the south, in the south uh, west area. So uh, Ivona not only is a good researcher, but she's been affiliated with us for many years, writing a particular column in our uh, journal uh, for every issue for you know twenty five years or something like that. So she she keeps her her focus is around Wuj where she lives. She's an older woman now, so she can't be uh, uh, running across all over Poland. And uh, and some of these people will also do translations. And then we have you know some other translators here, particularly a couple in the United States. And uh, these will take you to uh, our bookstore for those. Uh, in their words, volumes that we we spoke of, and uh, let's see, education. So here's an example. Here's here's a list of um, not as many as you have. Um, a lot of people will not let us put our put their stuff up there. You know, they're they make money doing their presentations. So they're not going to want to put it out there, you know, somewhere. But uh, we've got some interesting ones, you know, um, even on things like, you know, how did the end of serfdom impact genealogical records? That was a very interesting one, you know. And then some things about from archives. Uh, this one is how to navigate Shukai uh, Viakaivya, um, that's uh, searching the archives. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole presentation on it. It's really uh, kind of difficult. Uh, to figure out on your own. So that gives you a, a little feel for that. And, you know, getting started, some other things, uh, instructionals. Uh, we're building more video instructionals. We have a couple on there on how to use maps in various ways. Um, here we are, alphabets and pronunciation. Uh, let's see if I had church and cemetery names. Yeah. But we also have some big lists here of uh, occupations, uh, the Polish societies, and the fun ones are village life and village society. Um, you know, not just occupations, but things that, you know, nicknames for people or describing, you know, someone and, and not the best, just like here, you know, you'd have uh, village talk. And it has its own vocabulary for various descriptions, you know. But also things, if you have letters from people in the home country, a lot of times they'll be using uh, local language. And uh, it, you may not find that word in a dictionary. Uh, one, it may not be used anymore. Its meaning could have changed if you can find it in a current dictionary, English-Polish dictionary. Or two, uh, it's just not used anymore. Um, you know, something else has uh, taken its place such as uh, people who uh, grew up with uh, 
American old style Polish going to Poland in Lithuania. I, I noticed from a couple of people, and maybe you've heard the story. Well, they'll they'll ask you know in a restaurant or something you know where is the washroom, where is the bathroom, and rather than using toiletta, they'll use the old word which was outhouse, basically, and, and they get a funny look um, because they didn't have a word in the 19th century or maybe even the early 20th century. Uh, describing a modern uh, toilet facility, it was the outhouse. You know, they didn't they didn't have it. Um, and a little bit here on on writing for records and uh, some things on Polish traditions and so forth. So it gives you a little idea on the site. And oh, here, this is uh, uh, for members and non-members. Here, here are the research services that that we can do various kinds of research services. And here's Heller's Army and the Jubilee books. And as the note says, those, uh, if you go down to the, you know, these are handled by the Polish Museum of America. So that gives you a pretty good idea on some of the things that we have out there. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat box, Robert. So I think you've answered all the questions everyone had. Uh, if they would like to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Yeah, um, as I said, is you can you can go down here, contact us, and you can uh, send it to contact us or president. And um, on that last slide that I had up after I finished, you know, it also has uh, if you got some specific questions about membership, you can always send it to membership. Uh, and or or uh, you know research help, uh, but anyway, if, if one of us gets it and it goes to someone else, we'll we'll get it to them. Excellent. Well, that seems like a good place then to leave it is how they can get a hold of you. And I wanted to say thank you very very much for not only your first presentation but of course the second one as well. Uh, and I really hope that uh, my students will reach out to you and and uh, maybe even join your organization. It, obviously, I've, I know I've learned a lot. Um, I knew very little to nothing about Polish genealogy, and I certainly know a little bit more now, so I feel very, very thankful. Uh, and with that, unless you have any other questions, Robert, I will go ahead and stop the recording. No, um, let me just say it was a pleasure to visit with you again. Um, as, um, I hope I, um, as, I say, as you said, you know, answered a lot of questions, opened some eyes, gave some direction. And as I said in the opening, you know, as much as we covered here, uh, this could have just been the first part of a, a, at least a one, if not a two day presentation on how to do research in Poland. Um, but don't be put off, uh, as you saw in the examples, uh, most of the Polish sites uh, are very, very, other than the, the archives, are very intuitive and a good number of them have a click for uh, an English version and even if they don't have that, uh, you can do a, a right click and then hit the translate button and Google will translate it. Uh, just keep remembering that uh, um, if you got a town named Barani, it's gonna come up as Rams. <laughs> so watch it when you switch to English. So with that being said, again, thank you very much. And um, I hope some of you find some interest in joining us and you know, perfectly uh, willing and, and eager to uh, point people in the right direction if you send us some questions. And uh, have a great weekend. Oh, everyone. and also thank you once again for allowing us to record. We really appreciate it. You bet. Bye now. All right. Bye bye.